spring 1918. Revolution had taken Russia out of the war, releasing half a million German soldiers from the east. For a brief moment, Germany outnumbered the Allies on the Western Front. Here was her chance to win the First World War. We must strike at the earliest moment before the Americans can throw strong forces into the scales. We must beat the British. Behind the German lines, great armies rolled into position for the Michael Offensive, named after Germany's patron saint. All the roads were crowded with columns on the march, eagerly pressing forward with countless guns and endless transport. The German and the Allied air forces were closely matched, but Germany had the legendary ace, Baron Manfred von Richthofen. A special train carried his famous fighter squadron. Their brightly painted aircraft and daring antics had earned the nickname, the Red Baron's Flying Circus. These pilots were Germany's heroes. Among them, the future Nazi leader of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Goering. The Red Baron's dog, Moritz, with his own flying gear. Von Richthofen had already downed 66 enemy planes. He looked to the Michael Offensive to swell his tally. The Allies knew the Germans were about to hit them. They just didn't know where. The French reinforced the Chemin des Dames ridge. The British strengthened the line guarding the channel ports. But the Germans had their sights on the gap between, concentrating on a 12-mile sector where they knew the British were weak. Here, the British Fifth Army's trench system was shallow and incomplete. General Sir Hubert Goff had few reserves. Germany's supreme commanders had chosen well. Paul von Hindenburg and Erich Ludendorff carried their country's hopes. Virtually worshipped as demigods for past triumphs, they complemented one another's characters. Hindenburg, the rock, steady and unflappable. Ludendorff, the brains, but erratic, nervous. The plan was a short, intense bombardment to stun the British, then a shock attack by stormtroopers. Evolved since 1915, these were elite mobile soldiers armed with grenades and flamethrowers, trained to seek out soft spots and penetrate deep and fast into enemy lines. Ludendorff fixed the offensive for dawn on the 21st of March, 1918. The Germans hit the British with a million shells in just five hours.
Just before the bombardment ended, the battalion commander Major Scherer started to sing Deutschland, Deutschland über alles. We all joined in. It was the first time I had heard our men singing the national anthem since the autumn of 1914. Nine forty is zero hour. One division after the other breaks through in a gigantic leap, through the smashed wire entanglement, across no man's land, into the first enemy trench. Our bayonets are stuck in their bodies. The morning fog was thick with poison gas. Some British never saw them coming. We heard the sentry shout that the Germans were here and we all made a grab for our arms. A party of Germans came behind us and called on us to surrender. Well, we hadn't anything to say in the matter as there were hundreds to one. Seeing that the case was hopeless, we were taken, very much against our will. Lieutenant Stewart was one of 21,000 British captured that day. Panic spread as senior officers, used to years of static trench warfare, lost control in the havoc. As soon as communications with brigades ceased to exist, Divisional headquarters in many cases became paralyzed. They'd become so wedded to a set peace type of warfare that they were unable to function. General Goff ordered what was left of the 5th Army to withdraw. We could hear large numbers of Bosch on the roads in front. The tramp, tramp, tramp made one imagine the whole German army was advancing against my company. This was the biggest breakthrough in over three years of trench warfare on the Western Front. What our enemies never achieved, not even after month-long battles, we managed within two days. How happy and jolly the Kaiser must be. Finally, the initiative is back with us. It's a wonderful feeling. Demoralized British troops retreated over the Somme battlefield of 1916, giving up ground for which so much blood had been shed. It is pathetic to think that the old places where we were two years ago are now in the hands of the Hun, as also are the graves of many people we know. Edward's sister, Vera Britton, was a nurse at Etat, now flooded with casualties. There's only a handful of us, sister, and there seems to be thousands of them, was the perpetual cry, whether the patient came from Bapaume or Peron or Saint-Quentin. Day after day, while civilian refugees fled in panic into a top, some fresh enemy conquest was incredulously whispered. Peron, Bapon, Bohm and Hamel were gone. The huge German advance put Paris within range of the biggest gun in the world. This morning, the bombardment of Paris began with the three new Krupp cannons. The target is 120 kilometers away, and from launch, the shell takes three and a half minutes. The first French prisoners I speak to ask me anxiously whether it's true that Paris has actually been shelled. Traveling will be all the rage in Paris. Allied newsreels portrayed life in the city continuing as normal. But away from the cameras, civilians hurriedly packed their bags. 183 of the giant shells fell on Paris. The 
battle's going well. The enemy is in retreat, though fighting courageously and with heavy, bloody losses. A brilliant offensive, with great loot, over 3,000 prisoners, 60 artillery, and 200 machine guns. I receive a telegram from Crown Prince Wilhelm honoring me and my army. This evening, His Majesty the Kaiser returned from Aven, bursting with news of our successes. As the train pulled in, he shouted, the battle is won. The English have been utterly defeated. The Kaiser declared the 24th of March, 1918, a national holiday. He awarded Hindenburg and Ludendorff the highest military honors. Days later, Ludendorff's troops were still advancing. Some of the British started to think the unthinkable. I shall never forget the crushing tension of those extreme days. Nothing had quite equaled them before. Not the Somme, not Arras, not Passchendaele. For into our minds had crept for the first time the secret, incredible fear that we might lose the war. But German success in the Michael Offensive masked deep problems at home. The biggest threat to Germany and her allies had increasingly come not from their enemies, but their civilians. The crucial link between fighting and home fronts became decisive in 1918. The Central Powers were running a desperate race between victory on the battlefield and collapse at home. There are signs of the increasing scarcity of metal. In a small town near here, a sad ceremony took place. The ancient church bell, which had rung the people from cradle to grave for 300 years, was requisitioned. The inhabitants performed a funeral service for it. The bell was covered with wreaths and flowers and handed over to the military authorities under tears and protestations. Lead pipes were ripped up from the streets and melted down into bullets. The war was gnawing at the vitals of Germany and Austria-Hungary, and people's hearts were turning against it. They wanted change, peace and democracy. After a while, joy at the victory announcements abated. People stopped believing them. They weren't sure anymore what the truth was. I saw that the war had become old, and like an old person was no longer wanted. Surely peace must come soon. Something dangerous was building up in people. Something that smelled like rebellion. Dangerous ideas were coming in from Russia. Anti-war, revolutionary. Carried by German troops being moved from Eastern to Western Front for the Great Offensive.